All right, if you have your Bible, and I hope you do, I want you to turn to Genesis chapter 22. Genesis 22 is the climax, it's the apex, it's what everything has been building up to in the account of the life of Abraham. This is the scene where we arrive at Mount Moriah, the mount where Abraham takes Isaac to offer him as a sacrifice. This is a defining moment, obviously, in Abraham's life. But uh, Bible teacher F.B. Meyer says about this, he says, there is only one scene in history by which this event is surpassed. And that is the scene where the greater father gives his Isaac to a death from which there would be no deliverance. So this is, this, this is maybe the pinnacle moment of Old Testament history. And of course, from our perspective, 2,000 years after the ministry of Jesus on earth, we can see the account of Abraham and Isaac with New Testament eyes, can't we? We can see what God was picturing for Abraham and for all of Israel, but, uh, but they couldn't see it clearly back then. Before we get to the text that we're going to be looking at this morning, I just want to make a note about the chapter we skipped over, because some of you were here last week. You said we were in Genesis 20 last week. Now we're in 22. What happens to Genesis 21? Well, you remember when we started this journey through the life of Abraham, I told you that we were not going to be hiking and we were not going to be flying over, but we were going to be like on a family vacation. And when you're on a family vacation, sometimes you see the scenic bypasses and you don't take them because you just got to get where you're going. So chapter 21 is a scenic bypass that we did not take. We just didn't stop to see what's there. But I'll give you, while we keep driving through chapter 22, I'll tell you what we would have seen in chapter 21. It's just real quick, all right? Isaac was born. I mean, that's not insignificant. Isaac is born. The promise is fulfilled. A year after God had shown up and told Abraham, you and your wife, though you are physically unable to conceive, you're going to conceive and bear, ch bear a child, bear a son, you'll call him Isaac. He's born in chapter 21. And when he is born, it, it, chapter 21 tells us about his birth, and then it also tells us that uh, Abraham threw a party for him when he was weaned. So chapter 21 kind of compresses birth and weaning, that two, three-year period of birth and weaning all into one, uh, one, a couple of verses. And at the party where Isaac is, is, they're celebrating the fact that he was weaned, Ishmael and Hagar are at that party. Now, by this time, Ishmael is a teenager, okay? He's, he's probably 14, 15 years old, and he's there, and so he is Isaac's big half-brother. And all the Bible tells us is during this weaning party, Ishmael laughs. And it's not because Isaac's name is laughter. There, there was some kind of derisive, some kind of smirking laughing going on, some kind of big brother, wait till you're a few years older, I must smack you around kind of thing going on, right? There's something happening here that Sarah picks up on. She sees Ishmael laughing the, the, the mother of Isaac sees Ishmael laughing. She does not like that. She goes to Abraham and says, I want him out. I want him and his mom gone. And Abraham says, no. I mean, Abraham loves his son. He, this is his son. He's known him for 14, 15 years. He doesn't want Ishmael gone. But God comes to Abraham and says, no, he needs to go. I'm going to take care of him. I'm going to make him a great nation, but it's time for him to go. And so Abraham goes. He packs up. Uh, Hagar and Ishmael, and they are sent out, and they head out toward Beersheba. Uh, they head to the south, back toward Egypt, and um, there's a little scene in here where they get out in the middle of the desert, and uh, Hagar can't find water and thinks they're going to die, and she prepares to die. God shows up and, and shows her water in a well nearby, preserves her life, and makes the covenant promise to her that Isaac, he's going to take care, or that uh, Ishmael, he's going to take care of Ishmael, Ishmael is going to be a great nation, and uh, Ishmael does indeed marry and, and is the father of the Ishmaelites, the father of the Arabs, okay? And then there's one other scene in Genesis 21 where Abraham makes a treaty with Abimelech as they're living again in this area in, out near Gaza, and they just they have this uh, treaty relationship going on. That's chapter 21. That's what we didn't have a chance to get into, all right? So we're going to be in chapter 22 this morning. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to read through the chapter, and instead of reading all the way through it, I'm going to read and pause, pause and read and pause and read and pause, because there's some things I want to explain as we go through it. So we will read through it slowly. I'll make some comments as we go through it. 
And then we're going to come back after we've read through the whole chapter, and there are six verses that I want us to point out and look at this morning that I think are the six themes for us to look at this morning. The first verse we're going to come back and look at is the test. It's verse 1, God has a test for Abraham. The second verse we're going to look at is verse 3. It's the verse that talks about Abraham's obedient faith. Okay? Then we're going to look at verse 5, where we see that Abraham believed in a resurrection. We'll look at verse 9, where we see that Isaac was a willing participant in the test. We'll look at verse 13 and see that God provides a substitute sacrifice. And then verse 14, we'll see the new name for God, Jehovah Jireh. Okay, so those are the six points we'll come back and look at after we read through it. But let's, let's uh, pray before we read through this chapter together and ask God to give us the gift of divine illumination. Lord, we again bow before you. We confess that you are sovereign, you are wise in all that you do. And we ask that in these moments, as we spend time together studying your word, you would enable us by your grace to understand the truth found in this passage you would tune our hearts to hear the voice of your Holy Spirit as he speaks to us through this text. And uh, we pray that we would learn the lessons of faith. We would find courage and hope for our lives as we read about your promises to Abraham, that we would learn to walk in faith as Abraham did. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Genesis chapter 22, beginning at verse 1. This is God's word for God's people. Genesis 22. After these things, okay, stop right there, all right? I told you we're going to stop as we go through this. After these things, what things? Well, it could be the things in chapter 21. By the way, from the end of chapter 21 until the beginning of chapter 22 is about, I'm, I'm guessing it's 10 to 15 years have taken place. You say, how, why do you think that? The reason I think that is because as we'll see in this scene, young Isaac is asked to haul a bunch of wood up a hill. So he's got to be big enough, strong enough, strapping enough that he can haul wood up a hill. So he's got to be what? 12, 13, 14? Got to be something like that. So from the time he's weaned until now, a, a 10 years, maybe 15 have gone by. So after these things could refer to what happened in chapter 21, or it could be, as I suggested, chapter 22 is the pinnacle of it all, it could be that uh, Moses is saying, after all this happened to Abraham, after Ur, after settling in Canaan, after the flight to Egypt, after the promises of God, after the whole Ishmael and Hagar incident, after all of these things, after these things, verse 1, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. By the way, that is a good response if you hear the voice of God saying your name, a good response is, here I am. Adam's response when he heard the footsteps of God in the garden was to hide. That is not a good response. You can't hide from God. Where can I go from your spirit? Psalm 139 says, I go here, you're there. I go here, you're there. Don't try to hide from God. God calls, you say, here I am. Who else said that? Do you remember? Well, Samuel, right? Yeah, the, the, your servant listens. Okay, that's a good response. Verse 2. He said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I shall tell you. Okay, we've got to pause there. Now, about three things I want you to see as we go through this. First of all, God is telling Abraham to take his son and offer him as a human sacrifice. Just let that sink in for a second a burnt offering. Abraham lived among pagans who practiced this as a religious ritual. They would do human sacrifice to appease the gods. But this was not true of the God of Abraham. This is not what he called on, and yet here he is asking for it. It's a horrible assignment that God is asking Abraham to do. In fact, this is how human sacrifice was done in those days. Much like animal sacrifice, you would take the sacrifice, you would bind the sacrifice, you would bind him on an altar, and the first thing you would do is slit the throat of the sacrifice to kill the sacrifice. Once that was done, you would dismember the sacrifice. You would open him up and you would 
dismember him and then you would build a fire and you would take the human body parts and you would offer them in sacrifice on the altar in the fire. It's a horrible practice. And this is what Abraham hears God calling him to do. Now the question is, how can God call Abraham to do something that God would clearly forbid Abraham to do? Well, the writer of Genesis has already explained that to us because the writer of Genesis knows the end of the story from the beginning. He said this was what? A test. This was never going to be a human sacrifice. This was always going to be a picture of the, necessary, the, the necessity of human sacrifice for the forgiveness of sin in Christ. By the blood of both bulls and goats, no sin is forgiven. The only thing that's going to forgive sin is the death of a perfect person. God is foreshadowing the death of Christ. He knew there was never going to be an actual sacrifice, but he wanted to make a point with Abraham. And so as a test, he says, here's what I want you to do. So that Abraham is beginning to think, he's beginning to feel, he's beginning to experience the weight of human sacrifice, which, by the way, God himself would experience in the sacrifice of his son. Abraham would have a unique perspective on what it cost the father to offer up his son as a sacrifice, because for three days, Abraham lived with the reality that this was what he thought he was going to have to experience. Now, the second thing he says, it says, take Isaac, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. Is Isaac the only son? No, he's the only one left. Okay, and I think that's really the picture. When he says, take your only son, it's the only son left. This is the son through whom the promises of God are going to be fulfilled. And so the reference to him as the only son is the only son you have living with you, the only one left. And I think when God says, take your son, your only son, whom you love, uh, I, I think the reason he says that is he wants Abraham to know that he understands what he's asking Abraham to do. James Boyce says this, he says, These words, your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, seem cruel, but they should have reassured Abraham that God was fully aware of what he was asking him to do. Abraham, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. I know what I'm asking you. Abraham, do it. And also God is giving a picture of what his own experience would be. All, one other thing about this verse, where is it going to happen? He says, I want you to take him to the land of what? Moriah. Okay. Now you thought they called the wind Moriah. I, I just threw that in for Mike's benefit here. But this is actually a mountain, Mount Moriah in Israel. What, what's the other name for Mount Moriah? It's Jerusalem. This, take your, how do I know that? Because it's in 1 Chronicles chapter 3, where it says that the temple was built on Mount Moriah. And what else happened on that site? It was in Jerusalem where Jesus would be offered up as a sacrifice. You see, God says, take your son to Mount Moriah for the sacrifice that's going to take place. Again, foreshadowing that for thousands of years, for, for centuries, for hundreds of years, not thousands, but hundreds of years, there would be daily animal sacrifices on Mount Moriah. And that there would eventually be one perfect final sacrifice that would take place on Mount Moriah. So verse 3 says, Abraham rose early in the morning, which is an indication that Abraham obeyed instantly. God came to Abraham, said, here's what I command. Abraham didn't say, I'm going to need some time to process this, Lord. He didn't say, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with your command, Lord. I remember hearing Elizabeth Elliot one time say, pe people who say, I'm struggling, struggling is just another word for delayed obedience. And she said, delayed obedience is just another word for disobedience. <laughs> people say, I'm struggling. They're just saying, no, I'm doing what I want to do instead of what God's telling me to do. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't struggle. We do struggle, right? Abraham is struggling with what God is calling him to do. What's he doing while he's struggling? He's obeying. You don't wait to obey until the struggle is over. You may struggle in your obedience, but you obey. In the same way that 
that passing your second grade math quiz got you ready for pre-algebra and passing your, your, your pre-algebra quiz got you ready for trig and analyte and passing your trig and analyte got you ready to barely get through calculus. At least that was my experience. In the same way that these little tests get you ready for the bigger tests ahead, God had given Abraham little tests along the way and they'd gotten bigger and they'd gotten bigger and now here he is at the moment of the greatest test, his final exam, and he's ready for it because he's, obe because he's learned lessons of faith and he obeys. So he arose early, saddled his donkey, took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac, and he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. One Bible teacher points out that he thinks there's just a little hint here that Abraham is processing, that he's disoriented because you don't saddle the donkey then cut the wood. You cut the wood and then saddle the donkey, right? But Abraham gets up, saddles the donkey. He's just, he's kind of in this stupor that you've been in when you get hit hard with some news, right? And so he's up doing this. And on the third day, verse 4 says, Abraham lifted his eyes. He saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and will come again to you. Now, Abraham understood that what he was about to do in going and offering up Isaac on the altar was an act of worship. See, worship is not just that we sing some nice songs, right? Not just that we gather together in corporate prayer. It's not just that we declare the greatness of God through our words. We declare the greatness of God when we obey what he's told us to do. I'm going up to offer my son Isaac because that's what God's told me to do. And it worships God when I do what he tells me to do. What does Paul say in, in Romans 12? He says, I urge you, brothers, by the mercies of Christ, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, which is we think of that contradiction in terms. A sacrifice is something you put to death, a living sacrifice. How can there be a living sacrifice? Well, you're alive to God, dead to self. That's a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of what? Worship. To be a living sacrifice, to live life as a living sacrifice, is to worship God. And as we'll see... Um, Abraham also sees in this moment, he says, we're going up there and we'll both come back. Verse 6, Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac. He took in his hand the fire and the knife, so they both went together. I, I didn't stop to even think about this till I was reading the passage yesterday, but they're carrying fire with them. Abraham does not have lighter fluid and a match for the wood, right? He's got to carry fire and keep it kindled. He's carried it back from the home camp because there's no fire up on Mount Moriah and there's no matches. So he's carrying the fire and the knife. And Isaac is carrying the wood. And again, some have suggested that this is a picture, this is a prefiguring of the greater Isaac who carried his own wood to the place where he would be sacrificed. Jesus carrying the cross to his sacrifice. Verse 7, Isaac said to his father Abraham, my father, and he said, here I am, my son, and he said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where's the lamb for the burnt offering? I'm, I'm sorry, I cannot read that verse without just going, Oh, my goodness, right? Any parent, how do you answer a child, an innocent, sweet, obedient son who says, But I don't get it, where's, where's the lamb? Abraham says, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. And I have to imagine that Abraham was kind of looking away as he said it, wiping tears away, wondering. He doesn't know how this is going to work out. So both of them went together. And by the way, the God will provide. This is, this, is, this is the first time Abraham will say God will provide. He's later going to name the place God will provide. Here he says Elohim, the Most High God, will provide. Later he says Jehovah Jireh. He uses the covenant name of God. In the fulfillment, he uses the covenant name of God. Just an interesting point. Verse 9, they come to the place of which God had told him. Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order, uh, in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar on the top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But 
the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, here I am. Again, here I am. This time with expectancy. He said, do not lay your hand on your boy or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, seeing that you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Now, that phrase, now I know, we should not understand that as meaning that God didn't know beforehand. God is the omniscient God. He knows the beginning from the end. He knows the hearts of all men. He knew what was in Abraham's heart. He knew how this scene would play out before the scene played out. So when God says, now I know, he's really saying, now what has been hidden in you has been revealed. Now it's evident. And that's, a, that's another way to, to, uh, uh, to, to translate that word. Now it's evident. Maybe a better way of understanding what God says here. And by the way, that fits with what James says in James 2.18 when he says, some will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. This is Abraham showing his faith by his works, and God is saying, now it's evident. When I, was, when I was in high school, I took physics class, and I don't remember much about physics class, but I remember that we learned there were two kinds of energy. There's potential energy, and there's kinetic energy. You remember this? right? So potential energy is stored energy. It's the energy that's in a battery when it's not connected to anything. It's there. There is real energy in there, but it's not in use. It's stored. Kinetic energy is energy in use. It's energy that's at work. Okay, so when you hook something up to the battery, the energy that flows from it is, is kinetic energy. Okay, Abraham had kinetic faith demonstrate. He had potential faith that, w that became demonstrated as kinetic faith in this moment. When God says, now I see, he's saying that which was potential is now kinetic. This ends our physics lesson, and that's as deep as I can go on physics with you. Right? Verse 13, Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, uh, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it as a burnt offering instead of his son. God provides a substitute sacrifice. We'll look more at that in just a minute. Verse 14, Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. And again, we'll come back to that in a minute. And the passage wraps up with God once again confirming the covenant he's made to Abraham. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven, and he said, by myself I have sworn Keep in mind, this is the angel of the Lord speaking, and he says, by myself I have sworn, which indicates this is the, in, the pre-incarnate Christ speaking. This is God himself speaking, not a messenger, but this is God saying, by myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son. I will surely bless you. I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. Now, I just want to stop here for a minute. This is kind of interesting. In Genesis 13, when God gives uh, the second iteration of the Abrahamic covenant to Abraham, he says to him, look at the dust. If you can number the dust, that's how great your descendants will be. Then in Genesis 15, he takes him out at night. He says, look at the stars. When you see all the stars, that's how many your descendants will be. So we've got dust and stars, both. And here it comes back around. Look at the, the sand. Look at the stars. This is how great your descendants will be. Some have suggested, and I think there's warrant for this, that the dust represents the physical descendants of Abraham, the earthly descendants, the nation of Israel growing from his body, his physical descendants. The stars represent the heavenly descendants of Abraham, the spiritual descendants, the, the Gentiles grafted in as spiritual descendants, those who are his children by faith. So they say, you're going to have physical descendants, you're going to have heavenly descendants, and they're going to be both too numerous to count. And then verse 17, your offspring will possess the gate of his enemies, and your offspring shall be the nation, uh, and in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men, and they arose and went together to Beersheba, and Abraham lived at Beersheba. And we're going to stop there. The rest of this chapter is about Isaac eventually getting a wife and where his wife came from.
May God add his blessing to this reading of his word. Now, we're going to go back. We'll look at the six things that I told you we're going to talk about this morning. Thing number one is in verse one, and that is God tested Abraham. So the question is, why does a loving God put his children to tests? Why does a loving God bring trials or tests into our lives? You've asked that question before, haven't you? About your own life. Why would you do this? If you love me, why am I going through this test? Well, why does a teacher give tests to students? A teacher gives tests to students because for the student to progress, you have to be able to pass tests. You have to show proficiency in some area in order to go on to the next level. Teachers give tests to, to affirm students in how much they know and to show students where they're weak. That it's a measuring device to say, let's see how you're doing in the course you're in. Let's see where you're strong. Let's see where you're weak. Let's learn it together. Let's expose it so we know how to work on the weaknesses and so we can celebrate the growth that has already occurred. God comes to Abraham and says, I'm going to give you a test. Well, he doesn't say it, but that he is going to test Abraham. And the reason for the test is because he wants Abraham to be able to see how his faith has grown but also see if there are any weak spots. And by the way, Abraham got 100 on the test. He passed with flying colors on his final exam. And God wanted him to see. He wanted it to become evident how different a man Abraham was than the Abraham who had left Ur 35 or 40 years ago. He wanted him to see the work of God in his life. When I was in school, there were two kinds of tests we had. There were the planned tests where the teacher would say, now next Friday we're going to have a test, and you knew it was coming, and you studied for it maybe, and you, you, uh, but you knew it was coming and you knew it was important, and so you'd get together and you'd prep for your tests. And then there were the other kinds of tests that the teacher would give, and these were the dreaded ones. These are the ones where you showed up that morning, and what does the teacher say? Everybody get out a piece of paper, we're going to have a pop quiz. And you all went, oh, because you hated the pop quiz. You didn't know it was coming. You hadn't studied. You weren't prepared. It's just there. Life has both of those, doesn't it? There are tests that you can anticipate along the way. There are things you know are coming where your faith is going to be tested. But then you get your pop quizzes thrown in too, where all of a sudden one day it's like, oh, I had not planned on this test of my faith. But you better be ready because the test is there. When God brings these tests into our lives, it's not because he doesn't know what we can and can't do. It's so that we can see what we can and can't do. You understand there's a difference between trials and tests. Or excuse me, between uh, trial, trials and tests are the same. Temptation. God does not lead us into temptation. So there, here, the difference between a test and a temptation is this. Warren Wiersbe says, he says, it's the devil who brings temptation. It's God who brings tests. The devil brings temptation to bring out the worst in us. God brings tests to bring out the best in us. And Michael Youssef says, temptations are things we enjoy. Trials are things nobody signs up for. Temptation involves pleasure. Trial involves pain. Temptation is easy to fall into. Trials are hard to endure. Temptations satisfy your desires, and tests lead you to sacrifice your desires. There's a difference. You can tell whether you're facing temptation or a trial based on what it is that you're facing. God brings tests into our lives for good reasons. In fact, in 1 Peter, Peter says... Uh, in, we rejoice in the promises of God that there's an inheritance laid up for us. Peter says, you rejoice in this, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Your faith is put to the test so you can look and go, I do have faith in God. I do trust God. So that when, when Christ returns, you have a confidence that God has wor done a work of faith in you and that you've responded to that. One reason for trials is to test the genuineness of our faith. Another reason for tests is to mature us. That's the whole idea of James chapter 1. You count joy various trials because the endurance brings perfection. 
uh, I, Rick Houck, who went to the Air Force Academy, he's back with our kids this morning, he and Karen are, but he, when he went to the Air Force Academy, they had a, a two-week program of testing for their Air Force cadets. Week one, they had a simulated experience of being in a POW camp. And this was not where they went for a few hours in the afternoon and played POW camp and then went back to the barracks and slept there at night. This was a week of simulated POW camp, complete with how your captors would treat you in a POW camp, including very little to eat or drink. At the end of that week of testing, they had the second week, which is that where they would release the guys. You and your buddy teamed up. You're released. And now this week, you're supposed to pretend you've escaped from the POW camp. And they're trying to catch you. And you have to survive in the wilderness on your own for a week. Rick said, I got a sleeping bag and a compass. That was it. There were no rations, no nothing. You're just out there figuring out how to survive in the week. For the, for the week. Now, did the Air Force do that to those cadets because they hated them and wanted them to die? No. They did it to prepare them for greater tests that might be ahead and to show them at the end of the two weeks, I can survive this. God brings tests into our lives so that our faith will grow, so that we can get stronger and we're ready for what's next. God tested Abraham to show him how far he'd come in his own faith. In 1996, in January, Howard Hendricks went to the doctor to have a skin cancer removed from his face. Eight hours later, they found they had not removed all the cancer. And after more surgeries with a large hole in his head facing more invasive surgery into his skull, Professor Hendricks was told that one of the surgeries he needed might affect his sight or his hearing or his cognitive abilities. They were getting close enough to that part of the brain that it might affect his sight or his hearing or his cognitive abilities. Holding his wife Jean's hand, he said, now we get to see if what we've told others we really believe. He said, either God is sovereign or he's not. If he's not, we're in deep trouble. I'm coming down on the side that he is. After the operation, the doctor came out. He said, your cancer had gone as far as it could go toward your ear without affecting your hearing, toward your eye without affecting your sight, and as far as it could go toward your brain without affecting your mind. Prof responded, he said, if God had come to me and said, let's take another course, I would have said, could we make it an elective? <laughs> Nobody likes tests. We, we didn't like finals in school. We don't like tests in life. But God has a purpose in them. We just need to see how firm our faith is really is. Maybe you're in a test right now. How are you doing? You trusting God? You passing the exam? Or are you flailing and faltering and failing? God brings the test so we can do some self-assessment. When I took the SATs in high school, I had about a hundred point better score on my verbal than I did on my math and science. Anybody surprised by that? Okay. No. God uses those tests in our lives to show us where we're strong, where we're weak. Okay, that's enough about testing. Verse 3, Abraham's obedient faith. Warren Wiersbe says the main lesson in Genesis 22 is that obe obedient faith overcomes trials of life. You face trials of life, obedient faith. Our faith is not really tested, he said, until God asks us to bear what seems unbearable, to do what seems unreasonable, and to expect what seems impossible. That's true. Your faith is not really put to the test. If, if God asks you to believe something that's easy to believe, how much faith does that take? It doesn't take any faith to believe what's easy to believe. But when God asks you to bear what seems unbearable or to do what seems unreasonable or to expect what seems impossible, now it requires faith. And then Wiersbe says, we don't live by our expectations. We live by promises. As Christians, we don't live by what we expect. We live by promises. Kent Hughes says, in this case, God was asking Abraham to act against his common sense. It made no common sense to do what God was asking him to do, right? And he said, do it. He was asking him to go against his natural affection for his son, and he was asking him to go against his lifelong hope. And the human response to that would be to scream, no, that's crazy. 
And to top it all off, if Abraham did it, if he obeyed God, how is God going to fulfill the promises God has made to Abraham's descendants? Abraham did not wait till he had it all figured out to obey. He went to Mount Moriah. But first, he cut the wood for the sacrifice. And I don't want to read too much into this, but let's keep in mind, the guy's 115 years old and he's got a lot of servants. Why does he go cut the wood? Because he's a human being and sometimes you get hit with, work, with, with news like this and you go, I've got to go chop some wood. Right? I think Abraham's out there putting the logs up going, I do not, I do not get this. Just hammer away at it. I don't know. Here's the next one. They go, I don't get it, Lord. I'll obey, but I, I think there's processing and wrestling going on with every piece of wood that's cut. I think it was therapy that caused him to cut the wood. We've seen the examples of Abraham's flawed faith in previous chapters, but here the 115-year-old patriarch says, okay, I'm in. James Boyce says, when the command to sacrifice Isaac was first given, Abraham did not understand how if the command was carried out, the promise could be fulfilled. But that was all right. Abraham left that difficulty with God, which is the essence of true faith. He says, what is faith? Faith is believing God and acting upon it. This is what Abraham did. God had shown he could be trusted. Abraham believed God and acted, even though he could not understand the solution to the difficulty. He couldn't figure out, if I do this, if I kill Isaac, how is God going to keep his word? And then he said, you know what? That's not mine to have to worry about. I just do what God's told me to do. I'll let him worry about the dilemma. Dr. Boyce says, how could the problem be resolved? Well, two ways for Abraham to resolve this problem. He could have concluded God is erratic. He's wavering from one plan to another. He doesn't know his own mind. But this has not been Abraham's experience with God. His wait, his long wait for a son had proven that God would, in fact, keep his promises. So the other alternative is for Abraham to conclude that although he was, Abraham, finite and sinful, unable to see the resolution of the difficulty, God could be trusted. I can't figure this out. I'm going to have to trust God. It was the harder of the two solutions to accept, but Abraham's experience with God is what led him in that direction. And the same is true for us. There are times when we cannot see how God is going to keep his promises, how he's going to come through on something, but our job is still to obey. Having faith in God means that we decide he's trustworthy even when we can't figure out how it's all going to work out and we put our, our faith into action. That brings us to verse 5, Abraham's belief in the resurrection. After chopping wood and walking for three days, Abraham says to the two guys with him, you stay here, the boy and I are going up there, we'll both be back. He believed, he, he knew what God had called him to do, but he believed somehow Isaac was going to come back down Mount Moriah after the sacrifice. He believed it was going to be a real sacrifice, and Isaac was coming back. Donald Gray Barnhouse imagined what Abraham must have been thinking in that three-day walk with Mount Moriah. Here's how he lays it out. He says, Abraham and Isaac walked for three days through country growing more and more desolate at a slow measured pace of a burdened mule. Abraham's mind went around and around the matter, and ultimately he came to the calm conclusion that he was going to see a miracle. First he thought, God's not a liar, and God can't be mistaken, and he told me beyond question that I should have a son, and there he walks before me. God has said this son would be the only one through whom he would fill the promises. Therefore, this son has to live or God's going to be found false, and God can't be found false. And yet God has commanded me to put the son to death. This is a contradiction, but there's no contradiction in God. That's the foundation of the fact. There's power in God. There's wisdom in God. There's majesty and glory in God, but no contradiction in God. So what to be done with God's command to sacrifice my son? Since there's no contradiction in God, there's only one answer my mind can fathom. God's going to perform a miracle and raise Isaac from the dead. And we know that, by the way, because if you look ahead to Hebrews chapter 11, it says, By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, who, and he had received the promise, uh, was in the act of offering up his son, of whom it is said, through Isaac your offspring shall be named, he considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. Boy, was dead on the... I mean, he was good as dead, and he received him back. Warren Wiersbe also points out, Abraham had already experienced God bringing life from death in his own body. He was dead 
as a progenitor, and God brought him back to life. So the idea of a resurrection, which had to seem like a stretch, like a long shot to Abraham, still he believed that somehow God was going to honor his promises. Listen to this quote. I love this from John Calvin. He says, We pay God the highest honor when in affairs of perplexity we nevertheless entirely acquiesce to his providence. You honor God when you're perplexed and you say God knows what he's doing. That's what you do every time you decide to trust God in the middle of a test. You pay God the highest honor when in your perplexity you say, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. And Abraham was not the only one on the scene who was acting by faith. Look at verse 9. It's clear that Isaac had to be a willing participant, right? Think for a minute. How old's Abraham? 115. How old's Isaac? Oh, 15. Okay, so if you're on Mount Moriah and it's just the two of you, and Dad says, lay up here on the altar, I'm going to bind your wrists and your feet. Who's going to win that wrestling match if you decide to fight it? The 15-year-old can probably kick the 115-year-old, right? Isaac had to be a willing participant in this, an obedient child. He had to have done what his father asked him to do. Where did Isaac learn that God could be trusted like this? From his daddy. From his daddy. That's where your kids learn it. Your kids learn that God can be trusted by how they see it lived out in your life. They learn faith by seeing you be a person of faith. That's where Isaac had learned it. He, No doubt. I don't know if they did it at, at his birthday party, what we do at our birthday parties, but we tell your birth story when, when it's your birthday party. We rehearse the day of your birth. Well, you can imagine at Isaac's birthday party every year, it's the same story. Okay, so we had these angels come, and they told us, and the laughter, that's why you got your name. It was, it's a miracle. He'd heard about the miracle of his birth ever since he was born, and then he had heard all the stories about faith and how God had brought them all this far. And, and he had learned faith because that's the environment he'd grown up in. What neither Isaac nor Abraham knew on Mount Moriah was how God was going to resolve the dilemma. But they both responded in faith. And by the way, Isaac here is a picture of the greater Isaac, the son who willingly obeyed his father to the point of death on a cross. Right? Verse 13, the substitute sacrifice appeared. We don't have a lot to say about this. The ram caught in the thicket. This idea of animal sacrifice as a substitute for sinful men would become a central part of the worship of Israel for centuries, right? Where blood would run every day. And on the Day of Atonement, animals would be slaughtered with the idea that the sins of the people had been transferred onto this. The ram in the thicket becomes the substitute for the son who, who was to be slain. And of course, Isaiah prophesied that God would send one who would be a substitute, who would carry our burdens, bear our sorrows, who would, by his stripes, heal us. And, and of course, in John 1... When John the Baptist is in the Jordan River, he sees Jesus coming, he looks up and he says, behold, what? The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That had been foreshadowed all the way back here. Abraham's near sacrifice of Isaac at this point is both pageant and prophecy of the actual sacrifice of God the Son. God is both the tester and the provider in this story. And the same is true today. When God tests you, he's also the provider of grace. When God puts you in the crucible, he also pours out his grace so you can endure it. That's Paul's testimony in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 when he says, I had this messenger of Satan to buffet me, but God poured out grace. And that brings us to the last thing we want to look at. Verse 14, Abraham calls the name of the place Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. Just note here, it's the Lord will provide. Hmm. This is after the fact. What's Abraham say? Why didn't he call the place the Lord has provided? Why does he call the place the Lord will provide? Because Abraham, through the Holy Spirit, sees a, a greater day when God's ongoing provision, when he sees hope and redemption coming, God will provide for all of our needs in the future, including our spiritual needs. The specific prophecy here where the mountain is named, the mountain is named the place where God will provide. And of course, as we've already said, it's on that mountain that God provides the Lamb of God to take away 
the sin of the world. When we turn our attention every Sunday to the Lord's table, to the bread and the cup that represent the broken body and the shed blood of Christ, we're saying God has provided. This is the Mount Moriah table we walk up to every week. The Lord provides for our sin through the body and blood of His Son. We deserve death because of our rebellion, because of our pride, because of our unbelief. We deserve to be laid on the altar and have our life taken. But this Mount Moriah table is where God says, I've provided for that. I have, I have given the sacrifice necessary for your sins. One day, we will stand before God free and forgiven because Jesus has already taken our place and paid our price. And that's what we reflect on every Sunday. So Genesis 22 and the story of Isaac and the sacrifice really points us to the greater Isaac, the greater sacrifice, the greater resurrection, the one that occurred after Isaac was put to death, not a ram, but after Jesus was put to death, there was a greater resurrection that occurred, and God did indeed provide. We're going to come to receive these elements and uh, to celebrate communion this morning. We practice open communion here at Redeemer, which means if you're here and you know Christ and you love Christ, you're welcome at the table. This is a family meal for all who love Christ. If you're here this morning as a guest or as a visitor and you don't know Christ, the Bible would tell you not to come and receive the bread and the cup. And the reason for that is because before you can receive this grace from Christ, you need to first receive the gift of new life that is offered in Christ. And we can talk about what that means. I'd love to visit with you about it. It's what's pictured in the baptisms we're going to be doing this afternoon. It's the spiritual transformation that takes place in a person's life. If that's not happened with you, instead of coming and receiving the cup and the, the bread this morning, let's talk after the service about uh, how you can receive new life in Christ. Let me pray for our meal together here. Lord, thank you that you are the God who provides and that you have provided for us through your Son. Prepare our hearts now as we come to receive these elements that we may be strengthened by your grace. We ask in Jesus' name.
means the provision of the Lord for our sin, the body and the blood of Jesus. The blood of bulls and goats could not forgive sin. It required a perfect substitute, a perfect sacrifice on our behalf, and God provided that sacrifice in his own son. On the night before he was crucified, Jesus took the bread, and after having blessed it, he broke it. He passed it to his disciples. He said, this is my body broken for you. As often as you receive this, remember me. So, Lord, this morning as we receive this, we do remember your great sacrifice. We remember the cross. We remember the agony and the pain. We remember the anguish of the Father as he turns his face away from his Son. And we receive this bread grateful for what you've done for us. In the same way, when the meal was over, Jesus took the cup, and after pronouncing a blessing, he passed it. He said, this cup is the cup of the new covenant, my blood shed for the remission of sins. As often as you receive this, remember me. And so again, Lord, we remember that there was a blood sacrifice necessary, and that you offered your blood, you poured out your life, and by your wounds we are healed. Amen. Let's stand together. We'll sing just that chorus, this the power of the cross, and we'll be dismissed with a benediction here. This the power. May God, our provider, our Jehovah Jireh, bless you and keep you, make his face to shine upon you and give you peace as you go from this place now and forevermore. Amen. We'll see you at four o'clock for baptisms this afternoon.